Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Point Podcast. Everybody's doing well on this Monday after coming off a great weekend of sports, you know, great college football, NFL, as we discussed last week. Um, it's Monday, so we're doing two podcasts today. Um, do the NFL show, which normally takes up an hour of my time, and there was a lot of interesting storylines yesterday. We'll get to that. Immediately following this podcast, I record another podcast where I talk a lot of baseball, preview the wild card games, talk about uh, the crazy weekend coming down to the wire for the Blue Jays and Seattle Mariners, and we'll dive into all of that, including some uh, NHL stories with the Canucks signings, Brady Kachuk still being unsigned in Ottawa. So a lot to get into today. And looking at the sports world, what was it about this weekend? Sure, it was about baseball and getting to day 162. Totally interesting. Great. But baseball, the last day of the season fell on a Sunday, which you can't tell me that didn't hurt the ratings because people watch football on Sundays. The NFL has a whole day to themselves where they are not impeded by anyone. Yet, baseball had their storylines. But what was it about yesterday? There was better games than Sunday night football. There was better plays, players than Sunday night football. But the game at Gillette last night between Buccaneers Patriots was the day. It was the week. You can make the argument it was the season. People are looking ahead from the preseason to Bucks Patriots week four. Gillette Stadium, Bill Belichick v. Tom Brady. And for all the hype, for all the Brady's coming back, he's going to break the record, Gronk returns, the game held up. And there's a few storylines yesterday that I think you can make an overarching narrative, as I like to do after each week of the NFL season. But I would say for yesterday in the NFL, I look at growth and I look at growth from rookie quarterbacks. I look at growth from human beings in Bill Belichick and Tom Brady sharing a hug, whether it was compassion or not. And then reportedly meeting after the game, whether that's for PR or that was real sentimental feelings, we may never know, but we saw growth yesterday from many players and It has to start, for me, with Mac Jones. Mac Jones lost the game last night. I don't think it was totally his fault. I'll get to Bill Belichick and and the failure of of the Patriots losing the game, and I believe that's completely on Bill in that last drive. But what did we see? The New England Patriots had no running attack. The Bucs said, throw it wherever you want. We don't care. We're stopping Damian Harris, J.J. Taylor, Brandon Bolden. We do not care who you throw the ball to, but you're not going to run it on us. That's been the staple of their defense since Tom Brady showed up and Todd Bowles took over has become, you could argue, the best D.C. in all of football. So arguably what they're saying is, okay, Mac, rookie quarterback, four start, coming off a three interception game. It's on you, young man. He hasn't exactly been the most impressive player in the NFL through the first four weeks. I mentioned the three interception game last week. He is Captain Dink and Dunk. You could call him Dunkaroo because what did he do? Check down, check down, check down. However, last night I saw growth from a quarterback. I saw poise. And I saw a guy who was not afraid of the big moment. He was playing in a Sunday night game where tickets were going for as much as Super Bowls. Mixed emotions. More Tom Brady and Ron Gronkowski jerseys in the stands than Mac Jones, the quarterback who's actually quarterbacking the New England Patriots. But what did he do? He didn't whimper. He didn't sulk about it. And every play, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense knew it was going to be a pass. And yet he still had a hell of a night. Mac Jones showed why he was great at Alabama, showed what he's capable of. And last night, 
he even showed his intelligence. Richard Sherman, the quarter for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is playing his first game. Just signed on Wednesday. Hasn't played in a calendar year. What do you do in a corner who's probably not in the best physical shape, who hasn't had a lot of reps? You throw it to him as often as you can. And who was his favorite target last night? All right, Kendrick Bourne. You attack the weakness of the defense. But it's not just, oh, that's easy. He should know that. It's intelligence. It's getting the ball. It's timing. And it wasn't dink and dunk throws. He converted two third and tens last night. That's Tom Brady-esque. Tom Brady, that was his staple. In his last Super Bowl in New England, he converted three straight third and tens against the Kansas City Chiefs in overtime. I get it a different a different uh, time in overtime in, in a AFC championship game. But this is a rookie quarterback playing against Tom Brady, who most people consider the GOAT. And he still balled out. And he had an interception. Okay. Yes, it was, it was an interception you'd want to have back. But at the same time, he came back from that. He didn't say, oh, I got intercepted. We're done. He, the next drive, he attacked. After the interception drive in the second quarter, what did he do? He responded with a touchdown drive, throwing a touchdown strike. And I love the growth from Mac Jones. Now we get to the game within the game. And that is Bill Belichick against, you could say it's Byron Leftwich, the offensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which in a sense it is. But it's Bill Belichick's defensive scheme against Tom Brady. And you know, I had a few friends text me for the game, Brady, four touchdowns tonight for sure. Okay. Take didn't look real good at the end of the game. But okay, sure. You know, you, you got your opinion. It's wrong. Uh, but how many touchdowns did Tom Brady finish with? Zero. And last night was a picture perfect Bill Belichick game. What did they do? They pressured Tom Brady. Matt Judon was one of the best players on the field last night. The guy they brought over from Baltimore. That's why you bring him over at linebacker slash defensive end. He's like a Micah Parsons where he can do both. You bring him and you bring that pressure and he did it all night that Patriots defensive front was getting to Tom Brady he was frustrated no the conditions definitely helped Tom Brady didn't have a great game now I saw you know Chris Collinsworth on, on the broadcast say a few times how Cameron Brady should have made a catch well the ball was five feet over his head I don't know how you're going to catch that one but Tom Brady wasn't exactly Mr. Accurate last night but he relied on a good game from Leonard Fournette. That can happen. You need good you need good outings from your running backs. He got it last night from Fournette. But so Belichick had a great scheme. Brady didn't have his greatest game. And it looked like, you know what? They're going to be in this. And you get to the fourth quarter. And this is when you say, okay, holy crap. Maybe the Patriots can win this game. Brady, zero touchdown passes. Get Fournette go for 91. Mike Evans was getting what he wants, but they were holding them in check. A missed field goal. like they, they were getting opportunities. But we get to the fourth quarter. And we get to that last drive. And it's a fourth and three from the 56. And this is where it was. It, it was just crazy to me where. Nick Folk is coming up to kick a 56-yard field goal. It was a fourth and three. Mack was having a great game. He threw for more yards than Tom Brady. Yes, he threw an interception, but he had Kendrick Bourne all night. Jacoby Myers, even Aguilar got involved in the second half. And for Bill, you, you show that you didn't have faith in your quarterback. To me, if I'm, if I'm watching that film tomorrow and I'm Mac, I'm like, why were we not on the field? I can understand it somewhat. If the conditions are perfect, 
if they're pristine in New England, Nick Folk is a very accurate field goal kicker. But it's raining all night. Trenchell downpour in the second half, and you bring out Nick Folk for a 56-yard field goal? Nick Folk isn't Matt Prater or Justin Tucker. Yes, he's a good kicker, but a fourth and three? They need a field goal to win the game. I get it. But you missed the field goal, the game's over. The game's over. Fourth and three, you go for it. It was a schematic error by Bill Belichick. Great defensive scheme. You know, I, I think the Bucs had a great defensive scheme too. At times, there were times Mac Jones was getting hit where if Tom Brady was on the other end of that, that player would have been suspended for 15 years because you, you can make the argument Brady has led to a lot of these pass interference rules where you can't hit the quarterback anymore. He was getting killed in the pocket. But for Bill Belichick, who's the, the most considered the GOAT coach, the greatest of all, he failed in, in this instance. I don't know what was going through his head, but it was nothing but idiocy. Go for it. It's pretty simplistic. A 56-yard field goal in terrible conditions. Or a fourth and three where Mac Jones has been converting short passes. When it's either intermediate third slash fourth downs, he's converting them. Run a shallow cross. Get some picks where it's a high volume chance he's going to get the first down. Get Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne running double slants and they cross in the middle. So you have the option to go left or go right. And then throw Hunter Henry, run a stick route or a dig underneath. Again, I'm no offensive coordinator, but this is not rocket science. So it's 100% growth from Mac Jones, from the rookie quarterbacks in general, which I'll get to. But it showed nothing but idiocy and lack of awareness from Bill Belichick. And you can't condemn the guy because he's the greatest coach ever. However, you can monitor it. If this continues to happen, then you can bring up slippage. We talk about all the time how quarterback Bill Ben Roethlisberger's washed and he can't play the position anymore and he needs to be replaced by Mason Rudolph or Dwayne Haskins. We can talk about that with head coaches too. You're damn right. And for the past two seasons, I haven't exactly seen the greatest head coaching prowess from Bill Belichick. And I think that's something that needs to be discussed is what's exactly, what's he doing? Is he helping New England? His defensive scheme last night totaled. But you're a head coach. In the biggest moments, clock management, making fourth down decisions. That's your... That's the biggest point of the game. What you do scheme-wise, the rest of the game, if you don't win, is irrelevant. You can say, oh, I had a great scheme tonight. Oh, we're, on the, we're on the Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, I thought Mac played uh, uh, really well tonight. You get, but it, it's on you in those moments to make those decisions. You said Nick Folk, get on the field. Mac, get on the bench. Maybe you don't convert, but I'd rather go out swinging than watch strike three go past me. And to me, he lets strike three go past him. And um, it's frustrating, you know, definitely frustrating if you're a New England Patriots fan today where, you know, Brady had a special night. He obviously got cheered, booed during the game, which, I, which, which is what should happen. Yes, he's the greatest quarterback ever. You could argue, I don't think he is. I think Joe Montana is. Um, but he's he's an all-time great, and he's the, obviously the best player in franchise history. And he passed Drew Brees, all-time passing yards leader last night. But what I love about sports is you can, before the game, clap for the guy. But when the game starts, you're you're the enemy. The New England Patriots fans played that perfectly last night, and I appreciate it. There's nothing wrong with booing the opposing team. Nothing. I don't like when there's an injury and a team applauds, a.k.a. when 
Kevin Durant blew his knee up in Toronto, but that was pretty classless. But Tom Brady, you should boo the opposing quarterback. You should make it tough on them to hear their plays. Give any kind of advantage you can. And I thought it was a special game. I did not think it was going to be that close. And for them to keep the game in check, to stop Tom Brady twice in the red zone, it was impressive stuff last night from keeping them to field goals. Ryan Suckup made four field goals last night for Tampa Bay. They weren't scoring touchdowns. That'll be a frustrating film study tomorrow for, for the Bucs looking at it and saying, we were in the red zone so many times last night, we couldn't convert. That's Bruce Arians is not going to like that, looking at the tape and seeing that. Luckily, they have the Miami Dolphins next week, so they should be able to rectify those and play a, you know, a punching bag of an opponent. But for all the hype, I thought it was a very good game. Um, I didn't think it was going to be that close. Uh, honestly, I did not see it being a, a two-score game where New England make a good coaching decision, you win the game. But you don't. And you know, kudos to Tampa Bay. They're now three and one. And uh, you know, they are back in a really good position and they escape one of the tougher games in their schedule. They lose to the Rams, but then they respond with a with a narrow victory in Foxborough. It doesn't matter how close the game was, it matters if you won the game, which they did. They're three and one. The Patriots are one and three. You know, you look at that division, Jets, Patriots, Dolphins are all one and three. I thought the Patriots would be better. I still think they have the potential to get better because Mac Jones, I mentioned growth. He continues to get better. You look at Miami, they had a lifeless performance yesterday against the Colts. You know, Carson Wentz banged up. I don't know, like, it was just lifeless. They didn't have anything in the tank yesterday. I think they'll get destroyed by the Buccaneers next weekend. But you look at the Patriots, they go to Houston. Houston got shut out by the Bills yesterday. Davis Mills, that whole team, they're imploding. Don't like their chances of winning. Then the Patriots play the Cowboys. Okay, tough matchup, but you're at home. I don't rule out them, at least that being a competitive game. I'll talk about the Cowboys in this podcast and how I think they're legit. But, you know, then they play the Jets. Well, you got to win that game. That's a must win. So you, next couple games, there, there's some, make, you know, then they go to LA to play. The, they don't have an easy schedule. But they continue to improve. I see growth from Mac Jones game over game. And if we continue to see that throughout the season, it gives them more and more of a chance to win game in and game out. So we'll see where that goes. Growth being the, the headline of the week, of the narrative yesterday, I have to look at rookie quarterbacks. In week three, Trevor Lawrence had three interceptions for the Jacksonville Jaguars. In week three, Zach Wilson had three interceptions for the New York Jets. In week three, Justin Fields had two interceptions for the Chicago Bears, sacked nine times. In week three for the New England Patriots, Mac Jones had three interceptions, getting destroyed at home by the New Orleans Saints. And then you had Trey Lance, who was idle. But you get my point. It wasn't exactly, it wasn't exactly a great week for rookie quarterbacks. Looking at this week. Trevor Lawrence, best game of his pro career thus far, loses by a field goal at the last second. Again, you need a win. But his play, we saw growth. If they, He gets stuffed on a fourth and one at the edge, end of the first half, but we saw him play a great game where he really distributed the football. Look confident. He's got legs. He can move. Decision-making was there. A step in the right direction. Zach Wilson, who's been a turnover-prone quarterback, one interception yesterday, but what did we also see? Tony Romo said before the season, he, you know, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Zach Wilson has potential to be a top five quarterback in this league. One interception yesterday. What did we also see? Growth. Him throw deep passes. 53-yarder to Corey Davis. 54-yard pass to Keelan Cole Sr. We saw him grow as a quarterback, take those deep shots and hit on them. And what did he also do? He got his first win as a pro. Not only did he didn't just beat any team, they beat the Tennessee Titans yesterday. They ruined a lot of people's survivor pools. And 
I, I kind of thought it was a sneaky game because you had the Tennessee Titans with no Julio Jones, with no uh, A.J. Brown, their two top receivers. And what did it come down to in overtime? At first, I was looking at Robert Sala when uh, Zach Wilson got stuffed at the five-yard line. I wanted them to go for it, to win the game. Go for it. The Jets, they make a field goal, but then – Randy Bullock at the buzzer on overtime. The game would have been a tie. He misses the field goal. The Jets get a win. But again, Zach Wilson showed progression. Only one interception. Throwing the deep ball. Making good decisions and taking what's there. And he gets his first win. You never know. They play Atlanta next week in uh, London, England. Who knows? Maybe he can get another win. Atlanta uh, is struggling big mightily. And, you know, but I get a good week for Zach Wilson. So that's two rookies so far, one interception. I mentioned Mac Jones, one interception last night, but it's over far and beyond his best game as a pro. So much development, the reads, attacking weaknesses, reading the defense and not being dink and dunk, throwing the ball down the field, converting third and tens, third and longs, showing progression, check. Justin Fields, Matt Nagy almost gave me an ulcer last week with how he ran his offense. No movement of the quarterback, no help on the offensive line. That's terrible. Having of 20 dropbacks, 13 of them with five man protection, which basically means there's no tight end to chip. Nobody's coming in to help. And Miles Garrett and Jadavion Clowney were free to run after Justin Fields. And that did not go well for the Chicago Bears. But they go on to play Detroit yesterday, and what did we see? We saw movement. We saw them change their offensive game plan, and Matt Nagy turned in from Matt Nagy Gase, as in Adam Gase. I thought he was his twin brother, the way he designed that game plan in week, in week one, to competent. For now, I do have a complaint with Matt Nagy. But what did Justin Fields go? 11 for 17, 209, through an interception, but he still was efficient. A 64-yard pass to Darnell Mooney. A 28-yarder to Allen Robinson. He threw two passes over 50 yards to Darnell Mooney. He got five passes for a buck 25. Fields only ran the ball three times. What did they also do? Matt Nagy, you have a rookie quarterback. All right, you have David Montgomery, an elite running back. He ran the ball 23 times for 106. Damian Williams ran eight times for 55 yards. The Cowboys, who are an elite team, are running the ball more than they're passing it. I'll get to them in a second. But it just shows you, you need balance. And the Bears get a win against the Lions, who remain winless. Now, after all that growth, which is still the theme of the week, is that Justin Fields showed a lot of growth yesterday, played a good game, gets the Bears to 2-2. Two and two. Matt Nagy comes out today, and he just wants to take a piss on all that growth. And he says... So, yeah, uh, when healthy, Andy Dalton's still our number one quarterback. Justin's number two. Nick Foles, number three. Excuse me? Andy Dalton is still the number one court when healthy. Why? Why? Justin Fields is ready to play. When you design a game plan that's competent, that plays to his strengths, movement, play action pass, bootlegs, running the football, complimentary football. Justin Fields is better than Andy Dalton at everything. He can throw the ball. We saw him throw a deep pass yesterday to Darnell Mooney, throw a deep ball to Allen Robinson. He can connect on those passes. He did it at Ohio State with Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. It's not like this guy was dink and dunk his whole college career. He's got an arm. He's got a athletic ability. Let him use those skills. Andy Dalton is not mobile. Yes, he gets the ball out quick, but it's all, okay, five-yard screen. There you go. It's just Matt Nagy, I don't understand this cat. Like one Next week, it'll probably be Justin Fields because Andy Dalton will still be hurt, but the offense will look disastrous. After one week where you design a pretty decent game plan, I thought he'll find a way to ruin it. The Bears 
next week, have the Raiders in Vegas. Raiders are on a short week playing tonight. But somehow Justin Fields will get sacked 10 times next week. I, I don't know how that will happen, but somehow it will. And I, Matt Nagy, if you want to keep your job, which you shouldn't even have it right now, play Justin Fields. Show that you can design game plans for this quarterback, that you guys have a connection. Because newsflash, that's the only way you're keeping your job. You're not keeping your job because you're this offensive genius, because you aren't. You can plug and play any guy, if, but you, if your biggest thing you can have is if Justin Fields goes to organization, goes to ownership and says, I like Matt, you know, I like him as my OC. We get along great. He's running plays for me that I really like. It's not because, oh, Andy Dalton, the, the veteran who's not going to be back next year on a one-year deal, really likes me. Who gives a shit? But anyway, Justin Fields showed tremendous growth. This was bar none the best weekend for rookie quarterbacks. And we also saw Trey Lance, who had the mo- least amount of snaps for any of the rookies. He came in yesterday, completed 50% of his passes, which isn't great for 157. But he also scored. He had two touchdown passes, 76-yarder to Debo Samuel and a 21-yarder, uh, uh, two touchdown stories to uh, – Debo Samuel, who, who caught eight passes for a buck 56 yesterday. This was in a losing effort. Jimmy Garoppolo was injured at the end of the first half. But the Buccaneers are two and two now, losing two straight uh, to the walk-off field goal to the 49ers. I uh, sorry, to the Packers and then losing to uh, Seattle yesterday at home, both home games, which is a tough way to start the season. Then they go to Arizona next weekend, who are on a roll. But this is what Kyle Shanahan has wanted from the beginning. He drafted Trey Lance third overall to be the quarterback of the future. And Trey Lance has something that Jimmy Garoppolo really does not have much of, and that's athletic ability. Trey Lance can break outside the pocket. When you have running backs that they like to use, like Trey Sermon, like Elijah Mitchell, Hasty, you know, the plethora of guys they use, Trey Lance can do the play action pass. He can do the run pass option where he can keep the ball and and break it off and and get chunks of yardage. Jimmy Garoppolo cannot do that as part of their offense. He runs when he has to scramble and he dies just to get a yard or get back to the line of scrimmage. But what do we know about Jimmy Garoppolo, a.k.a. porn star Jimmy? He's going to get injured at some point, and he did. He hurt his calf yesterday. He said he's going to be out multiple weeks, and – you know, this is just the opportunity for Trey Lance to grab hold of that offense. If he can play consistent football, if he can get a few wins, if he could potentially get a win against Arizona next week, I don't think Jimmy's getting his job back. To be honest, I'd be surprised if Jimmy makes another start for the San Francisco 49ers, period. Because you don't draft a kid third overall and not play him. That's just today's NFL. Guys don't sit on the bench for that long. You have an injury now. Trey Lance ran the ball seven times yesterday for 41 yards. So he's showing his dual threat. And again, I don't think he's the greatest passer. He still has a lot to learn playing at North Dakota state, but he's got the athletic ability. He does have a big arm. You could, you could argue as the biggest arm in this draft because he can chuck the ball deep. Debo Samuel will love him. Who Debo Samuel still leads the NFL in receiving yards. He had a buck 56 yesterday. So athletic. But I am intrigued. I like Jimmy Garoppolo. I said last week, I don't think it was smart to, to make the change. And I still don't. I think if, if healthy, Jimmy should be the starting quarterback. However, you don't have a choice now. Garoppolo's hurt. He can't play. The Trey Lance experiment starts, and we'll see what kind of growth he has. I thought he had a pretty good game yesterday. He scored a touchdown on his last drive. He was too little, too late. They couldn't get the onside kick. Seattle escapes with the win. So now... Seattle gets the two and two, a win they desperately needed after losses to Minnesota and Tennessee, who came back from 16 down in week two. So the NFC West gets more and more interesting, especially looking ahead where we have two division games this week. But we talk about growth and we saw that in early weeks from Matthew Stafford, where he, him and Cooper Cup were lighting the world on fire. They couldn't be stopped against that box defense. It was just a plethora of, oh, just a crazy, amazing route. You shake guys, you're open. Going to Deshaun Jackson deep. But 
what can happen is, you know, the other team can play too, and the other team can watch film. And I think we saw that yesterday from the Arizona Cardinals. For years, the Arizona Cardinals, since hiring Cliff Kingsbury, have we've seen flashes of this team be very good and make smart decisions. They got great defensive players in Chandler Jones and my man Buda Baker at safety. But they just watched film, I believe, from the week before. Because what do we see in the first quarter? The Rams go on the first drive. It results in a field goal. The next drive by the Rams, they try that Deshaun Jackson deep shot that they completed the, you know, the, the previous week against the Bucs. But what did they do? He threw the ball into double coverage. Byron, Byron Murphy Jr. intercepts the ball. That's his third interception in two weeks. They watched film. And what did they do the whole game? They didn't give – they doubled Cooper Cup. Van Jefferson, Robert Woods were going to have to beat them. The run game has not been great yet from the Rams, and it really was just a dominant performance where the Rams couldn't get anything going on offense, but they couldn't get the ball back either. Tyler Murray is – and this is – I hate ranking MVPs in week four, so this is just narrative-based. I'm not saying he's going to win it because making that – it's like saying, you know, somebody's going to win the Rocket Richard. Uh, you know, I'll make that declaration. Oh, awesome. Matthew's going to win the Rocket Richard. Today. Okay, good for you. You can, um, that's not, that's not my show here. But through four weeks, Kyler Murray is the MVP of the National Football League. Just the way it is. I, I he has shown so much growth over just a season. He's throwing from the pocket. Before, he couldn't throw from the pocket. He was uncomfortable. He had to run outside and break it up. But now he'll stand in the pocket, throw it, set his feet, not throw off the back foot where he gets intercepted, but throw the ball deep. We saw him. And what has he got now? Two reliable guys that he trusts. He always had Jahandre Hopkins. That was easy. But now he's got A.J. Green. And AJ, we saw the first touchdown pass of the game. He goes to AJ Green on David Long. And what happens? AJ Green's just a bigger body. He's stronger. 41 yard touchdown to AJ Green. He had five for 67. He had DeAndre Hopkins, who had four catches for 67. So he had he had a decent day, even though Jalen Ramsey held him in held him in check like he usually does. But then you have Big Max Williams, the tight end, formerly of, of Baltimore, five catches for 66. But it didn't matter. Kyler. He throws 24 for 32, 268, two touchdowns, no turnovers. You had Chase Edmonds, 12 carries, 120 yards. The defense of the Rams couldn't stop a sieve yesterday. James Conner, 18 carries for 50 yards, two touchdowns. They got a two-headed monster at running back. Edmonds and Conner. Conner was a guy that was given up on by the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's found new life. Two touchdowns yesterday. And then you have Kyler who ran six times for 39. They have balance. They have great defensive players. Byron Murphy Jr. only continues to get better. Buda Baker's a stud, a perennial pro, bowl, pro bowler. Chandler Jones is still that dude. And I look at this team and it just continues to get better. Cliff Kingsbury gets more and more creative. They signed a good kicker in the offseason and Matt Prater. That's pivotal. He goes three for three yesterday. Longtime kicker, formerly of Denver, won a Super Bowl, and that was in Detroit the last number of years. But yesterday, you know, it, it just was, it wasn't there. You know, Cooper Cup at five or 64, not a bad day. But it just wasn't a great day for, for LA. They muffed two, uh, two kickoff, you know, recoveries. They couldn't hang on to the football. You can't turn the ball over because Arizona was scoring. And Kyler was just throwing the ball to whoever he deemed fit. They win by 17 on the road. Just an ass kicking of ass kickings and an impressive one at that. And you look at this division, which is still the most intriguing. You have Cardinals 49ers this Sunday, where the 49ers are coming off two straight losses. The Arizona Cardinals are one of two teams to remain undefeated. That would be themselves and, and uh, Las Vegas who plays tonight. So that could end tonight or, or continue into next week. But next weekend, 525 game, San Francisco in Arizona, coming off two home losses, and Trey Lance is going to be in their quarterback. Two athletic guys, that game should be entertaining, honestly. Um, but you have that game. And then there's Thursday night, 
Rams at Seahawks. Seahawks get a win on the road, a big win. Russell Wilson was vintage yesterday against San Francisco where he broke outside the pocket. He was creative. He ran with, he still got his legs. He's not what he used to be. He can't rely on it all the time anymore because that's Kyler Murray. That's Kyler Murray is the new Russell Wilson, except I think he's better being in the pocket than Russell is. Kyler, he is so fun to watch. It's unbelievable. His little legs going, he doesn't look like he should be a quarterback. He looks like he should be a punter, but the guy is a flat out stud. And so Rams at Seahawks Thursday night on Fox. And this is a big game. Well, for, it's a big game for both teams, the three and one Rams, two and two Seahawks. But I think it's a bigger game for the Rams because the Ram Matthew Stafford, he had three weeks, three very good weeks. You beat the Colts. That's a good win. Uh, obviously, you start off, you, you beat the Colts. I, I like that. You, you beat the Bucks in there. That's an impressive victory. But you, you lose to Arizona at home. You get crushed. But what do we know about Matthew Stafford? Very good quarterback, but he could never get over the hump. And it's early in the season. I'm not saying he won't have more success. I think the Rams are still an elite team. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I'm not down on the Rams because of one loss. That's that's idiocy. And that's, you know, I'll let you, I'll let the mothership do that in all their overreaction Monday type shows. However, you update your resume every game. Tom Brady updates his resume. He's won seven Super Bowls, but he wants to get an eight. That's updating his resume. The more you play, you update your resume. Stafford, you've never won a division title in your career. And if you're going to win one this year, it's tougher than it has ever been. Because, yeah, you had Aaron Rodgers in the division all those years, but guess what? You got Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, and a San Francisco team that's very, very good. So go to Seattle, arguably the toughest place to play in this division, and get a win. Just point blank. It's very, it's going to be loud in there in Seattle. The 12th man does not shut up. But you're on a short week, figure out some changes to your game, and, and Sean McVay, do that as well, because you were out coached by Cliff Kingsbury yesterday, point blank. And for that Rams defense that was elite, we saw some great defenses through the first three weeks really get exposed yesterday. Rams, Panthers in the game against the Cowboys, I would point to them. Um, I thought the Green Bay defense stepped up, but again, the Pittsburgh Steelers offense is questionable. So Green Bay's did show up yesterday, but there was a number of them that just looked great, but they didn't play that great yesterday. Chiefs still <laughs> defense still stunk. Ravens defense was impressive yesterday against the Denver Broncos, but I digress. It the, the NFC West is loaded, and it, it'll continue to be an interesting storyline throughout the entire season. But we'll see where this takes us. I mention all the time about hype, and there are teams who get hype, and they flat out don't deserve it. Um, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Every year, it's they get talked about ad nauseum. I repeat, ad nauseum, and they don't deserve it because, yes, they make a lot of money, but they do nothing when it comes to winning. And the Tampa Bay Lightning don't get talked about as much. The New York Islanders, who've been to back-to-back conference finals, the Toronto Maple Leafs would kill half their fan base to get to a conference final. You have the Boston Bruins, who don't get talked about near enough. San Jose for a decade, you hardly know they're in the league. They're still talking about Toronto and Salute Gate. Who cares? Right in that discussion, right there is the Dallas Cowboys. Because the Dallas Cowboys have not been to an NFC championship game since 1995. In that period, they have won two playoff games. They have been the most talked about franchise, and you could argue all of the world. Maybe Manchester United would be right there. Maybe, you know, teams across the pond, the Maple Leafs, the Bronx Bombers, New York Yankees. At least the Yankees made the playoffs. They won a World Series in 2009. 
they're a perennial threat. The Dallas Cowboys, Toronto Maple Leafs, just flat out aren't. They're never in it. And, however, I mentioned updating your resume. The Toronto Maple Leafs could put that argument to bed this year. They could have a great season, win around, put themselves on the map, and then you deserve to be talked about. Not just because Mitch Marner broke a nail on a Tuesday night. Who cares? The Dallas Cowboys, same thing. But I look at this Dallas team, and I really like it. I think the Dallas Cowboys are elite. I mentioned my hierarchy of the NFC, and it hasn't changed for me. I still think the Rams are the best. I'm right, I'm right there. I, I put the Cardinals at two. I, I put the Rams still one, but I have the Cardinals two. I still want to see the Cardinals play. I know they beat the Rams yesterday, but that's one game. Um, I'll see as it goes. I can change that. I have the Cowboys over the box right now. The Cowboys are three to me, and there's a reason for that. It's called balance. And that you have a quarterback who threw four touchdown passes yesterday in Dak Prescott, but you never know it. Why? Because the running attack of the Dallas Cowboys is flat out legit. They have a two-headed monster in Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard that can chew up your defense whenever they deem fit. Ezekiel Elliott, who has been talked about for not having that burst anymore, who doesn't have that, just that killer instinct. He doesn't have the speed. I can't tell. Because yesterday, he ran 20 times for a buck 43. Then you had Tony Pollard run 10 times for 67. And oh, something I also love to see, Dak Prescott, for, through the first couple weeks, was really tentative moving. I don't blame him. He's just coming off a broken ankle. He's starting to scramble more. He looks comfortable. He's not as fast maybe as he used to be, but he's not afraid to run. Yesterday, ran four times for 35 yards, including a 21-yard rush on a third and 10 to pick up a first down. He's getting more comfortable. But look at that. Over 225 yards in rushing yesterday. Dak only threw for a buck 88. He threw the ball 22 times. They ran the ball 34. The Dallas Cowboys have lost, I believe, one game since Dak Prescott has taken over as starting quarterback when they run the ball more than they pass. That's the key. It's just balance. It's not all about – Dak is still an elite, elite quarterback. Touchdowns to Dalton Schultz, Amari Cooper, Sed Wilson, and Blake Jarwin. Balance. Again, I talked about how the week before against Philly – they won a game handily where the two best receivers were hardly involved. Look at this. Amari Cooper, three for 69, one tub. Okay. But it's still a pretty quiet game. CD Lamb caught two balls for 13 yards. And they won, they only won the game by eight, but the game was over well before that. You can look at their defense for playing weak down the stretch. I still think their defense has something to prove. Uh, I, I, I don't love a lot of their defense. I'll admit that. But what makes me like this team is they have two studs on defense, and that's Micah Parsons and that's Trayvon Diggs. I'll start with Trayvon Diggs. Last year, he was a guy that was, you know, risk it for the biscuit. He would come up, make a big interception, but the next leg get burnt on an 80-yard pass, and he looked like the goat, lowercase, on a lot of plays. But he's figured out how to play corner. He might not be the best man-to-man corner. When you're playing zone and he's in the middle and he's defending, he's a flat-out ball hawk. He reminds me a ton of Xavier Howard of the Miami Dolphins, who I think is the best, one of the best cover corners in football, him or Jalen Ramsey. Trayvon Diggs will never be the best man-to-man cover corner. He will not be a Darrell Rebus. But when it comes to occupying space, being that general to see what's happening and pick out certain places to be on the field, that's his strength. And I look at him and he can do that with such effectiveness. He has five interceptions in his first four games. That, that's just a flat out ball hawk. And I, I, I love the way he's playing. Then you got Micah Parsons. They need to put him more at defensive end than linebacker. because He's getting more pressure than any player on that Cowboys defensive line. More than Randy Gregory. 
more they can rotate anybody and he gets more pressure consistently and they got to sam darnold you know sam darnold i didn't think had a terrible game yesterday he had two interceptions and back-to-back drives in the first and the third quarter you don't do that the game's pretty close you know the game would have been maybe uh you know it was eight points but it would have been closer than it actually was he you know threw two touchdown uh, two touchdown passes to dj Moore. he rushed for two I like to see him use his legs, but it's an impressive win for the Cowboys. They're three and one following their first, uh, the opening day loss. And now they got the giants and it was a good day for New York football because the giants, we saw Saquon Barkley really get some of his game back, uh, had a game winning touchdown rush was used in the passing game. The giants beat the saints and an ugly loss for the saints and their return to the Superdome where you just can't lose that game. There's games on your schedule, especially for the Saints, where you're you're gonna have to play. You already lost to Carolina divisional game. You have to play the Bucks twice. You need to have that game, and they you can't afford to lose that one. And they did, and that that's one that's gonna be a tough pill to swallow. But I, I look at that type of game and say you gotta win that one. And so, even though it's a good day for New York football, and Danny Dimes I, for the most part has played good football this year. He, you know, he had his struggles in the first couple weeks. But I look at him yesterday, one interception, but 20 for 40, 402 yards, uh, you know, throwing strikes, throwing passes to Kenny Galladay, Gadarius Tony, the rookie out of Florida, finally got involved. Like I mentioned, Saquon had five catches for 74. John Ross, the third, had three catches for 77, the deep threat who just came off the IR. So I, I like that part of the game. Jameis Winston was a fe- was efficient, didn't turn the ball over, but they couldn't get the win. So we'll see. But I, I think the Cowboys are in a good position. They're in a really weak division. The Washington football team just narrowly defeated Atlanta on their last the last drive of the game where just heroics by Taylor Heineke, where he threw the ball across the field. JD McKissick, he's a running back with a ton of speed, gets to the edge, finds himself into the end zone, and that was the ball game. But again, I don't trust the football team. Their defense is still showing a lot of problems. The Giants get a win, but I don't think they're a very good football team. The Eagles lose to Kansas City. It looked interesting for a bit, but they're getting more and more decimated. And again, I don't love their team to be consistent. And they've already got crushed by the Cowboys once this year. So we'll see what happens in the rematch. But I believe the Cowboys are legit. Are legit sorry. They're going to have to continue to prove it. Again, they got the Giants. Then, I, then they go, they got the Giants this weekend. Then they go to the Patriots. That's not an easy game. You know, weather can be tough in New England. Then the Cowboys have, they might have their bye. Um, week seven, if I'm looking here. Yeah, they're on their bye. Week eight, they return with the game against, let's see here. They go to Minnesota. That could be, it's, Minnesota's look good this year, but again, I don't trust Minnesota. Then they play Denver, not an easy game. So they're going to have some interesting games down the stretch to prove that they're a very good team. You know, they, they got to prove that. It, every Again, every week it's updating your resume. They got Atlanta in there. That's pencil that one in. Um, so, again, there were some upsets yesterday for sure. You know, the, the two New York teams winning was definitely, uh, you know, an upset for some people. The Colts got their first one of the season. Um the, uh, the Ravens really beating the Broncos as easy as they did. It was apparent to me when Teddy Two Gloves, Teddy Bridgewater, went out with, with a concussion. And just that, that brought, it was an impressive game yesterday for the Baltimore Ravens, just their pass rush, uh, getting to Bridgewater, the pressure they put on him. I, I thought it was a really, really impressive game by the, by the Ravens as a whole. Lamar played, played well, but I just thought it was a really good team win. You know, um, uh, Mark uh, Brown caught the ball, which was nice. Uh, so that was, that was a positive, but um, yeah. So, but I, I just think the Cowboys are a really good team. They have to continue to prove it week in, week out, but just looking ahead, I they'll have their opportunity to do that moving forward. Um, the AFC North is an interesting division. Because you have the Cleveland Browns, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Baltimore Ravens all at three and one. And to me, the most proven team in that division thus far is the Baltimore Ravens. They have defeated 
the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, and they defeated the Denver Broncos, two division leaders at the time. The Broncos were undefeated yesterday. They beat the Chiefs. Anytime you beat the Chiefs, I don't care if the, how bad the Chiefs' defense is, it's an impressive win when you beat Patrick Mahomes. Now, they should have lost to the Lions, but they're 3-1. and one. I look at the Broncos. They blew a game against the Chiefs where they should have won. And, yes, they've won three in a row. But the Bears, their offense did not look good. And yesterday, the Browns win in Minnesota. But it was not because of their offense. And looking through their game through four, week, uh, through four weeks, my biggest concern with the Browns so far is their offense. Jarvis Landry is out, and I, I do like parts of what they're doing. The, the best thing they can do is establish the run. And then for Minnesota, I just I watched a lot of that game yesterday, getting my notes here. What they do great is they run the ball, and then they can use tight end screens where they just check the ball down to a tight end. They get lead blockers, or they can do that with Kareem Hunt. It's so efficient when they give the ball to Kareem Hunt in those cases. But again, they only scored 14 points yesterday. Mayfield went 15 for 33. He's throwing wild high. He's not an, he's known to be accurate. He threw, he was 44, 45% completions yesterday. That's God awful. Didn't turn the ball over. We look, Nick Chubb ran for a buck. Kareem Hunt, 14 for 69. And Kareem Hunt, uh, you know, in, in receiving game, you know, the leading receiver yesterday was Rashard Higgins. But you look at their tight end screen, Hooper, they go to Njoku. That's, they couldn't establish it because they need to, they need the, the deep pass and get the run game going, and they couldn't yesterday. So that's what it, their offense does not con- their defense does not concern me. That's elite. You got Miles Garrett, who's just a beast. Jadavion Clowney's starting to pick it up. John Johnson and Troy Hill in the backfield. Denzel Ward is just a stud with a huge play late on a deep pass to Justin Jefferson. So I like, and what did they do? They know what the Vikings do well, and that's run the football. Delvin Cook ran nine times yesterday for 34 yards, three-yard average. Alexander Madison ran 10 times for 20 yards, two-yard average. They didn't give them anything. And they kept feeling three catches for 46 yards. So it was a day where they couldn't get a lot going. And the Vikings fall to one and three. That's got to be frustrating. You know, they could should at least be two and two after that missed field goal against Arizona. That was a game yesterday they should have had. They scored on their first possession. Took over seven and a half minutes. Then the Browns go over seven and a half minutes, turnover on downs inside. They had two, two times of the Vikings saw them yesterday after eight plus minute drives. No points. And yet they still lose the game. That's a frustrating loss for the Vikings. But I still really believe in Cleveland, but my biggest worry right now is their offense. I, I see him looked at Odell a lot, which is my concern. Uh, and that's not really on Odell. That's on Baker to, to be smart. Odell only caught two passes yesterday for 27 yards. You get a win, but just give the ball to who's open. If you finish the game and Austin Hooper has the most, has the most catches, that's a victory in my, in my book because that's smart football. The Browns head to LA. They play the Chargers next. That's a big test. Chargers will be in a short week because they play this evening. But again, it's about getting these big these games that mean a little more. Okay, they're all worth the same, but it's just an, it's a chance to prove something. I, I look at the Denver Broncos next weekend. They have the Steelers. That's a prove it game to me because they're coming off a loss. Hopefully, Teddy Bridgewater, who left with a concussion, can come back. But you're playing the Steelers at Heinz Field. Go in and get a win there. You get back to four and one. You feel good about your team. Um, the Saints and Washington football team next Sunday. Both teams need this victory. They're both at two and two, but the Saints still need to prove that, you know, Jameis at quarterback, that they can win big games. They lose yesterday at home. That's a prove it game to me. Uh, Bills, Chiefs. The Bills, they're playing next Sunday night. The Bills won yesterday 40 to nothing, but they played against a, Junior varsity team in the Texans. They're terrible. Davis Mills, a shopping mall quarterback, could not get anything done. Uh, and, you know, Josh, five turnovers forced by the Bills defense. But again, they've won three in a row since losing their first game to the Pittsburgh Steelers, which seems like an anomaly at this point. But you're on the road heading to Arrowhead. The Chargers went into Arrowhead and won. The Chiefs defense gave up 30 to the Eagles yesterday. Jalen Hurts was throwing it all over the yard. And guess what? Jalen Hurts isn't Josh Allen. 
Josh Allen, you have the Chiefs defense dead to rights. They're terrible so far this year. They cannot stop the pass. Nothing. They can't do anything on this team. Daniel Sorensen, a guy I like, is being picked apart. I feel bad for the guy. You, you know, Mike, uh, Mike Hill getting torched on the back. Mike Hughes are getting torched on the back end. Thank God they have the Honey Badger, or they'd have nothing back there. But Chiefs can still play off offensively. Yesterday, uh, Patrick Mahomes, you needed a, a, a responding game. He had that. Did you know one interception, but he had five touchdown passes. Pretty good day. Tyreek Hill had 11 catches for a buck, 86, three touchdowns. Why not? Yeah, you didn't cover him the whole day. He had buck 86 of Mahomes, 278. Incredible day for him. But you got to look at the team and say, what the hell is going on? But the defense is a sieve. You got Emmanuel Sanders. Dawson Knox has become a, a, a red zone threat. That's something I hope he develop into. He is. That's a big game next week. Prove what you got. Show the growth. Show that you learn from that loss last year in the AFC Championship game and that you can overcome that and win that big game this year. So an opportunity for the Bills next Sunday to really put their stamp on this season and you know how they, how they plan on being a factor come the end of this season. Now, week four ends this evening, and that'll be the uh, – Las Vegas Raiders, the undefeated Las Vegas Raiders, the sec, uh, one of the two only teams undefeated in the NFL, heading to Los Angeles to play the Chargers. And what a great Monday night football game it should be tonight. I look at the Raiders. They, they're not doing much wrong so far. Last year, their defense was one of the worst in the NFL. The biggest weakness of their team. But it's become a strength with guys like Jonathan Abram, Max Crosby getting pressure. It's been dominant. I, I love the way they're playing. The Chargers. Um, Justin Herbert is an elite quarterback. We saw him how he, they beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead last week. But can you respond? They lost to the Cowboys at home. That was a tough loss for them. But how can you respond this week with a division, another divisional game? Raiders are coming in hot. You know they're going to be prepared. They got a good running attack. They got a strong team. But Joey Bosa, can you get pressure? I look, I look at Herbert, run the football some, but take your chances. You have two wide receivers that can beat anybody. And I come to corner, man-to-man. -man. Mike Williams and Keenan Allen are two of the best route runners in football. Keenan, they're very different. Keenan Allen is not going to burst you down the field. But when it comes to just precision routes, he's a lot like Cooper Cup. He will do it so efficiently. Mike Williams can beat you down the field, but also you throw him a 50-50 ball, He's so big, he's going to go up and catch it. And so I, I look at that and say, tonight's matchup is more about the Chargers wide receivers against the corners of the Las Vegas Raiders. And we'll see who can win that matchup tonight. And that could be the game. I think you're going to see that the Raiders have some safeties come over and help because those two, those two guys are so dangerous. Give them, the, give them tight ends. Give them Austin Eckler underneath. What you need to do is try to try to neutralize those receivers the best of your ability and just hope for the best for the rest of the team because otherwise it's going to be a long night. And it might be a long night for me with you know the way Dirk's barking right now. Uh, but and for the Raiders, Derek Carr's throwing the ball. We see him, he's chucking the ball deep. Henry Ruggs, Darren Waller. But this is what Derek Carr does. He's He's not this average quarterback that people make him out to be. The guy's a really, really good player. And I think for him, if he gets protection, which he has been getting so far this year, this would be the biggest test because I think you look at the Ravens have a good pass rush, but they don't have a Joey Bosa on, on their, on their uh, D-line. Joey Bosa can wreck games like his brother Nick, like Aaron Donald. Can he get to, to Derek Carr tonight? Can they hold up? And we'll see what the Chargers defense can do because after they, they forced four interceptions, last, uh, four turnovers last week against the Raiders uh, or against the Chiefs. And I think they're going to have to force a few tonight if they're going to win because the Raiders are efficient. They can go on long drives or they can score quickly. They are just a, they can do it either way on offense. And that's the best teams. And that's what they do when it comes to winning in the NFL. So Monday Night Football tonight, Raiders at Chargers. Should be a fun game. We'll see who can come out on top. But 
like I said, I'll be, I hope to do a podcast if I can calm my dirt down to do uh, talk some baseball, talk about the 162 yesterday, talk about the NHL season starting up, college football, which was a lot of fun over the weekend, and uh, preview uh, everything else coming this week on To The Point. So as always, thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate the support. And uh, I'll be back real soon to talk to you all. So take care and we'll talk soon.